it was one of these things that consistently happens in San Francisco for me. If you have a positive, like if you have a, a an intention that has creativity and it's also cultivating community in some way, it feels like it's held up like um, like ca a caterpillar legs holding us up with um, hundreds of different um, supporters. That was artist Brian Goggin. I'm Jeff, and this is Storied San Francisco. Every week on this podcast, you'll hear from artists, comedians, photographers, and San Franciscans from all walks of life, telling stories, sharing personal histories, and trying to put into words what makes this city so special. Welcome to episode 48, part two. In part one, Brian talked about his childhood and becoming an artist. In this podcast, he'll explain what went into two prominent works of art he's done. The Defenestration Building, which unfortunately no longer exists, and Caruso's Dream, which is up on 9th Street between Mission and Market. He ends the podcast with the projects he's working on now. Our show, Is San Francisco Dying?, is still up at the Laundry on 26th Street in the Mission. Please go to letsreimagine.org for more info, including ours. Here's Brian. So Defenestration is a piece uh, that I created in uh, 1995 through 1996. And I was, uh, it was one of the projects that I brainstormed with David Mack, the artist I had worked with as his assistant. And I'd been doing collages of this piece when I was in... France. We were in a part of Paris and there was a building that was being torn down um, across from the gallery where we were working and it was this 16th century apartment building and it was hard to see a place with wooden beams and just something that felt to me very precious just being torn down to a place with a, a modern building. And something older than the United States. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and they left the walls of the building and took all the floors out and they just so you could see where the staircase was and the bathroom and the kitchen from the tile and some of the beams and the the image of the furniture that was in the space like the memory of that building that had been passed on from generation to generation of all these people that have come and gone and lived lives there seemed to resonate and um, I I was really uh, I felt like it was important to notice that because I felt like I'm leaving a trace as I move through uh, life and consciousness and we all want to feel like it, it has some sense of meaning. And so to honor all of that meaning, this life force that went through like a firefly, um, I was trying to figure out how could I make an art piece about that? That was my concern. And what came up was this notion of the furniture attempting to still stay on like a ghost coming back and clinging onto the side of the building. And so... I started doing drawings of furniture climbing on the sides of buildings. And when I was here in San Francisco, I was attracted to a number of buildings and I started doing collages of what this kind of an image would look like on some of the buildings. And I went to those building owners to see if I could get support from them to um, create the piece. Meanwhile, I applied for a grant through the National Endowment for the Arts that was being run through the New Langton Arts Gallery, which is now defunct. Um, and it was when the NEA was still giving money to, to individual artists. I think it was the last year before the Republicans canceled it. And they gave me a grant before I had even solidified a location to create the piece of $3,500, which to me at that time was an enormous amount because I was used to living on pen for for pennies for burritos you know and so and um so 3500 was huge boon for me and um and it gave me the enthusiasm to then go to the mayor ask the mayor for a letter of recommendation that i could then use along with the grant 
to talk to different building owners and I ended up finding this building it was a 1908 brick building on the corner of 6th and Howard streets and is four or five stories and the owner happened to be in India where he was from from Gujarat visiting relatives and his daughter who had just graduated from art school happened to be responsible for the property and was manning the fax machine when I sent a fax that asked her if I could put this artwork on the side of her building along with the drawing of what it would look like on the side of her building and she sent me a fax back because at that time it was all faxes um, saying come down to my office let's talk it over and I went down and at the end of that meeting, um, she said, as long as you can get this piece up before my dad returns in six months, you, you can have permission. Once he's here, I think he'll love it and I'll, we'll talk to him and, and so we'll ask his permission after it's up. And so that, that, it was as easy as and as hard as that. It was the miracle of that. It was one of these things that s consistently happens in San Francisco for me. If you have a positive like if you have a, a an intention that has creativity and it's also cultivating community in some way, it feels like it's held up like um, like ca a caterpillar legs holding us up with um, hundreds of different um, supporters. And so businesses all around San Francisco donated um, materials and over about. 90 or so friends of mine volunteered time we built it up over the course of a year a uh, uh, engineering company donated its engineering services we had to get permits for every single art piece um, i mean it was a long process and it created this ripple of a community that still seems to reverberate because i I meet people who grew up with that piece. It was up for 17 years, and they, they tell me that it, it influenced them. Or some people uh, have told me that they decided to move to San Francisco because that piece exemplified a, a way of, of seeing the city. And um, I don't propose that that's the case, but I do feel honored that some people feel that way. And... It definitely came out of this um, good humored uh, intended intention to kind of follow up on that kind of art life that we were continuing across the street, but in a three dimensional form. And at the time, I was also working with um, some performance artists, and my, it was my turn to create. A big project so defenestration was my circus experience I was it was called dream circus so um, defenestration had to come down in uh, 2014 and I had notice I was uh, working with the city to keep it up after the city had purchased it from the last landlord and they generously let me keep it up for a couple of extra years. And uh, because I knew it was coming down, this idea and opportunity coincided to create a sculpture on Ninth Street at Mission and Ninth Street. And um, I had been interested in pianos and hanging a piano off of defenestration. And I never was able to do that. So I started researching relationships between pianos and the South of Market area. And I found that in the 19th century, there was a Sherman Williams piano factory that was down on um, Howard Street. And at one point, there was a sinkhole out in front of the Sherman Williams or uh, out in front of uh, where the Sherman Williams um, factory was located and a woman fell into this um, sinkhole and was drowning and people s threw a rope in and they pulled her out and um, people were so frustrated 
at this sinkhole that they just started throwing whatever they could gather around them into this sinkhole. De- and debris? And debris and, and junk. Rocks. And um, one of the things that was offered to help fill the, uh, the sinkhole was a broken piano that was uh, left over from the Sherman Williams factory. And they pulled it out and pushed it into the sinkhole and then covered it with some stones and the the piano held that sinkhole for a considerable number of years. And um, it seemed like it was planting this literal piano seed in this location. Um, Not too far away, the Palace Hotel, I found out, was... um, the the place where Enrico Caruso chose to stay when he was here in 1906. And uh, the night before the earthquake, uh, Enrico Caruso sang at the opening of the Mission Opera House, which had just been completed. And he uh, sang Carmen to a standing ovation, went back, celebrated with people at the palace. And then the next morning... He woke to the earthquake along with everybody else in San Francisco and later wrote that um, as he walked from his bed to the window, his room rocked like a boat on the sea. And in reading that, um, I imagined this image of glass pianos hanging off the side of the building on Ninth Street as if... Enrico Caruso in this half awake sleep uh, or yeah this half awake kind of state of mind um, could have somehow uh, had this vision and um, and so I built uh, pianos grand pianos um, baby grand pianos and upright pianos as if they were made out of factory windows, which could have been built uh, at the time that Enrico Caruso was visiting San Francisco. Also interesting defenestration. Now you're building pianos that are windows. Right. So it's as if the the furniture's pushing through windows, becoming windows, and and moving into this um, alternate perspective, this alternate reality. And then the pianos um, are held off the side of the building with wooden struts that could be seen in old mining or bracing systems. And um, then at night, the pianos illuminate with light that pulses through all of the pianos, almost like dancers on a stage. Um, And there is an hour and 45 minute show of compositions of light that correspond with and um, play with a broadcast of Enrico Caruso singing various different songs. And you can pick up on that by listening um, in with uh, uh, FM radio. Only during a certain time, and it's every night? or Every night um, after 4.30 to 10.30. I try to catch people in the, the rush hour. Okay, and is it one of those frequencies you have to be pretty close to the the source, or, or is it... Yeah, you have to be within 500 feet, I think. Okay, okay. I mean, it's, it's the kind of thing I would probably want to just listen to, but also go down to Ninth and Mission and check this out, it sounds like. Yes. I had a couple of questions. Yes. I wanted to just let you talk, but also, um, so when you said you had kind of always wanted to incorporate pianos into defenestration, was it through learning the things you learned about the sinkhole and about um, Caruso on the night before the earthquake? Or or where did that come from? Where did, where did the piano idea originate for you? Well, the, as I was drawing out the plans for defenestration early on, I had planned to have an upright piano hanging off of the turret of the building. And I, completed engineering drawings to enable me to hang a piano off and the the plan was to have a playing piano so a friend of mine could climb up there and rig himself off of the piano and actually play Um, but it was just too cost prohibitive to put the 
the steel beams that would have been necessary through all of the floors and into the basement. And at the time I was building defenestration on a shoestring budget. So it was just something that was set aside. But throughout my career, I keep going back to the piano form and a number of these different forms, uh, including bathtubs, that um, have a kind of uh, charismatic resonance in society. And they also catch light in an interesting way because it combines straight lines and curves and a lot of the ideas that I find interesting in sculpture, but in these industrial products. I was going to say curves. That's the first thing that's that can, in my mind, connects the two objects. Well, and also industry, like the pianos were only possible after the industrial revolution when the combination of, um, fabricating in foundries combined with, um, high craft cabinet makers could come together to create an object that takes a year to manufacture and then a public that can afford that kind of thing. And then the pianos took on such an interesting role in society. And then likewise bathtubs, these cast iron bathtubs from a particular period of time were being fabricated in the same place where they were making all sorts of um, tools and objects that related to building up our cities and um, at the same time they have this uh, welcoming um, story that links them to the heritage of bathing throughout history in and the relationship between human beings and bathing is something that seems uh, pretty fascinating the way that different cultures approached it from the middle ages um, when people bathed very rarely. I mean, even during Queen Elizabeth's time, I remember reading that she said, I uh, bathe once a month, whether I need it or not. But then the Romans bathed honey. all the time. <laughs> right. <laughs> and they had theaters and they had restaurants and they had libraries in their baths. There's also a history of bathhouses in San Francisco. Right. As you well that, know. Sure. Yeah. And, that, and they were... Um, hubs for culture and for inspiration for people here in San Francisco as well. Families. And, yeah. I mean, sutra baths. Sure. One example. Oh, yeah. And then bathhouses as, as recently as the late 20th century. And some now. And still now. Some Kabuki now, yeah. and oh, yeah. the, there's just the Russian baths out by, um, out by Hunter's Point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then the whole area, like up in Napa with the springs and everything. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm totally with you. It's, it's an interesting aspect of our life. And like you said, um, inviting and intimate and all these things. So bathtubs, funny you bring those up. Did you want to talk about that? Oh, yeah. Well, um, so the... I'm working on a project right now called Fine Balance, where I'm creating sculptures using Victorian claw and ball bathtubs as primary elements that will be um, lifted up 24 to 23 feet, 27 feet in the air, and held aloft with stilts that are bound to the legs of these uh, seemingly mobile bathtubs that will be uh, apparently walking along the water's edge in Petaluma. And I'll be casting five different Victorian tubs. So each of them have their own unique character. Their, um, the claws and balls and the, the arms will be slightly elongated to suggest life. And yet they'll be positioned at around the height that the furniture was on defenestration. So in, a, in some respects, it's like defenestration without the building. Mm. And by positioning these objects up in the air in this incongruous location, I find it inspires me to look at things differently. And I'm hoping that the people will enjoy and appreciate that as well. But it's certainly a, an interesting challenge to try to figure out how to do it engineering wise and it, sometimes it feels a bit like being a, a plate spinner 
and I'm just practicing right now with my plate spinning in the studio to try to figure out how to keep these things up. Right. How's the plate spinning going? It's good. Right now we're casting the the bathtubs and um, I'm getting the the materials I need to be able to build the st- stilt forms in my studio and I'll be um, hoisting them up into the air and, and trying different uh, stilt positions very soon. Sounds like in general, a lot of engineering is involved in your art. Is that f- fair to say? Well, um, early on when I was a kid, I, I dabbled in uh, magic and doing illusions. And I had a neighbor who helped me build a floating lady or floating person um, illusion and the the illusion where you cut somebody in half or where you slide the middle out of somebody and uh, I found the fabrication of the illusions as interesting in some case more interesting than performing them I ended up doing very silly performances where often they just involved a lot of comedy but I would I would do the the make the illusions and then perform them as well but I like the tension that's created by not knowing how something is supported so i've tried to bring that interest into the sculpture where i try to make something that seems slightly um, difficult or impossible possible like uh victorian cloth of bathtubs 27 feet in yeah. the air. That's, I'm going to put that in that category. Um, you said the bathtubs are being cast. Are they? Do you cast those downstairs as well or or here in the city? or um, In South San Francisco. Okay. Yeah. I'll be casting those in a lighter material so that they're not going to be 450 pounds up in the air. <laughs> right. so, so that if they fall, they don't create another sinkhole. Right. <laughs> We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> That's what you're solving for now, so that's good. Um, okay, anything else you want to talk about with your art, either that you've done or, or up, anything upcoming that we haven't talked about? Um, let's see. I'm also working on this project where I'm building a um, ice reliquary freezer system that will be solar powered and house and preserve a ancient block of glacial ice and I'm working to source um, the appropriate block of ice it's I'm not sure where that will come from yet but I'm interested in possibly negotiating with authorities to see if I could get a piece of a glacier that will imminently melt in the next 10 years so that we have have some remnant of it and the exterior of this freezer system will be uh, constructed with salvaged wood but in the style of a gypsy wagon and painted somewhat like uh, work trucks in South America or work trucks in Italy or gypsy wagons so that it has this ornamented quality that also suggests um, movement and travel and mobility um, along with preservation and I'm very excited about that project I'm I've constructed the um, the framing system for it and I'm in the process of uh, refining the freezer system designs and then I'll be fundraising to create that freezer system and then finishing off the the freezer I don't have a place to show it yet uh, that's the next um, thing that I'm going to start working on but I wanted to get the project really rolling before I started contacting like a, a museum or a gallery would you like it to be in San Francisco is that your top choice or does it yes. doesn't matter no I'd love to sh- debut it here in San Francisco and um, you know, maybe there's an opportunity for me to show it at a gallery here or a museum. I'm just, I'm not sure yet. Uh, something we'd like to do this season with all the guests is what is it about San Francisco? And it could be either from when you arrived, I know the city changes, it's constantly changing, to what keeps you here? Um, what drives you about San Francisco? The... Uh, combination of my community here that I've uh, 
really deeply connected with, along with the aesthetics and um, soul of this city, the um, the movement, the the excitement of being around so many people that are striving for um, something that's pushing the limit of their uh, whatever their passion is. And if I'm around other people that are focused in that way, it inspires me to continue pushing the edge of whatever I'm consciously working on developing. It also feels like San Francisco is a place where people are uh, interested in self-realization. And I, I love coming across people that are approaching it from so many different ways. Perhaps it's the case everywhere in the world, and I'm sure it is. But here it feels like there are a lot of teachers that come here teaching crafts and philosophies and perspectives about literature. And if you want to learn something, you can almost always find somebody who can tell you a really interesting approach to discover whatever you're looking for. It's almost like we don't need Wikipedia and YouTube here as much. (laughs) No, and it makes sense that it came out of here. That too. It's like if the world gets access to the right. kind of things that we have walking around the street, going down to the library, seeing and hearing lectures, um, having an opportunity to um, go f- hear an opera and see an opera, but then also go and be part of a performance art project that is happening on the street and is totally free mm-hmm. and uh, may catch you completely off guard. Um but the the things that are hard are that the 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 city changes and every generation that lives here goes through the struggle of and the nostalgia of seeing what they became attached to drift away and then and then see the the city evolve into something else but if i look back at the history of san francisco i feel comforted in seeing that it's cyclical and uh just when things seem like they're at their worst, then things get better again. And so it feels like we're going to just continue developing in that way. And I'm hoping that I can add something to the culture of San Francisco by continuing to work hard as an artist and support other artists and creative people and be part of um, uh, keeping the bohemian... Um, art scene alive and um, and having access to a community like Project Arto that enables artists from so many different um, mediums to come together and live safely at a reasonable rate. I mean, so many of my friends have had to move out of the city or into much smaller studios because they haven't had the benefit of a nonprofit really supporting them. So if if there are ways I can help manifest more studio space for other artists, I'm interested in that. That was artist Brian Goggin. Join us next week for the 49th and final episode of Season 2. We'll be hearing from local photographer Chloe Jackman. Music for the podcast is by Otis McDonald. Film photography is by Michelle Kilfeather. You can find all episodes on our website, storiedsf.com. While you're there, please help support what we do by going to our store page and choosing from several different pledge levels. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please rate and review the show. And if you have any feedback for us, our email is storiedsf at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.